Um, thanks for the introduction. Um, a little added bonus to this presentation. I didn't realize it when, uh, when we talked about this, but the uh, ED director and some of his team are actually in attendance. So not only will you be able to see this presentation, but any questions related to the actual operations, performance, and numbers, uh, they're directly accessible at the very back, and they wouldn't mind at all answering questions. The uh, emergency department that, uh, that we're going to showcase first, it's in Springfield, Missouri. Uh, it's, it's fairly unique. It's certainly unique across any of the ones that we've ever worked on before because we were actually able to incorporate every single bell and whistle that you can imagine under one roof. Uh, we haven't been able to do that. We weren't able to do that prior, and we haven't been able to do it since. So it really stands out from that standpoint. They're a level one trauma center. And uh, this year, they'll be seeing about 72,000 patients. Uh, and what we've designed is uh, capacity for the next 10 years uh, in one fell swoop, so they won't have to go back in the near future. What I want to go through is the design concepts that led to the, uh, the arrangement and planning of the overall facility. We start with the exam room. And like we talked about, like you've heard before, the, the flexibility of a universal exam space. Uh, this particular module uh, that, is, that is at the core, uh, 62 rooms is what, they, is what they have within the facility, we same-sized and standardized every single room. So you walk into one room, a, a typical exam room, you can't tell the difference from one end of the department to the other. It has all the same amenities, the sink is in the exact same place, the doors are the same, the gases are the same, everything. Uh, the size and the configuration of the room uh, are exactly 150 square feet. Uh, the size, depth, orientation, all of that's important. One, it allows for an actual nine-foot sliding glass door that gives you a total clear dimension of 50 inches, which is extremely important, plus it breaks out. But uh, every room has a sink, a 32-inch flat-screen TV, a case cart per room, uh, the document station in every one of the room, and then a family area. And then we take that same, same concept of standardization along the room, and we incorporate it into a pod that is standardized. So each one of these pods are made up, in this particular case, of 12 rooms, or the initial intent was a 12-room pod. They're arranged identically, and then they have support space at each one of the corners. So your clean linen, your soiled utility, your nourishment, all of those areas are decentralized within each individual pod. And the pod itself then becomes a self-sustained mini emergency department. And then the number of pods are relative to the volume and, and the acuity also that, uh, that the facility sees. The core of the pod is what we call our bullpen, and that's what Sherry alerted, alluded to earlier. So this is our team care area. In this particular configuration, we had assumed that we would have a patient care team made up of one doctor, three nurses, tech, and uh, a unit secretary. The ability to flex in and out with uh, mid-levels is there as well because the, the number of rooms is based on the physician and the mid-level component and what they can tree and seat. When you take those individual pods then, what we do is we arrange them along a central spine. And so the pods themselves are flipped about a central corridor and that in turn turns them into racetracks. And when you talk about a, ble a breathing emergency department, this is one of the physical manifestations of that. So. During the day when you're the busiest, you have all five pods up and operating. As your volumes start to decrease later on in the night, then you turn them off, you turn them down, and at the end of the day, uh, I think right now they're running two pods 24 hours a day. And so they have the flexibility to operate these pods based on census and patient arrival. And then one of the other unique features about this particular uh, emergency department is each one of these pods operating as its own independent emergency department within but linked by this central spine uh, has clear story elements within the pod area and what I mean by that is and you'll see in the pictures is we have elevated the ceilings up to 17 feet and we have glass clear stories wrapped all around so there's natural daylight into not only every staff space but every care space and then another thing that we did was we took all of the, all of the non-clinical components out of the facility. So IT closets, um, uh, electrical closets, anything that was not core to patient care, and we put them up on the roof in a self-contained spine, and we call that the mechanical spine. 
uh, what it does is it maximizes the efficiency of the space. So you got only core uh, space, you know, necessary for patient treatment on the ground floor. It also separates that maintenance traffic. So you don't have maintenance people coming in and working in a patient care area. They can access everything that they need up in that space, never having to uh, cross traffic. And so when you get a diagram just of the facility, we have you know, just this, what we call the integrated spine, and that takes you across all the pods, back to imaging, back to the main hospital, and then we separate that clinical spine with a public spine, and that's for the main traffic outside of the ED, takes you back and forth to the hospital as well. Our ambulance traffic arrives on the complete opposite end from our walk-in traffic. We keep those completely separated, and then they just tie back and forth down that center. And this is just a, a shot of, so you have your drop-off traffic that is more like an airport that can accommodate anything. Uh, I think we can accommodate up to 10 vehicles if, if necessary, undercovered, adjacent to the main walk-in. You have your public corridor, which you know is um, a, a well-appointed public corridor that gets you back and forth to the hospital without having to have cross traffic through the emergency department. And then your main spine, uh, you can see visually the three on, on your right hand side of the screen, you can see the three individual racetracks. And one of the things that we did in this, in this project was we color coded every one of the pods. So instead of people having to remember what number pod they're in or family visitors and things, everybody remembers colors. And so the wayfinding was enhanced with this as well. Now all of it put together, and once again, one of the unique things is just packing everything under one roof. We relocated the entire emergency department from the north side of the existing hospital to the south. So when we did that, we brought imaging, we brought everything that we wanted. So within the emergency department itself, it has an embedded imaging uh, center. It has a 26, uh, 26 fully private bed OBS unit. Um, and then it also has the main administrative component for the ED. So trauma ED, uh, their offices are right off of one of the pods. The waiting room, when you first come in, you'll see a waiting room that is completely open. You'll see uh, visibility to the triage rooms. One of the unique features of the waiting room is they actually went with three triage rooms in this particular model. And what we did was we put them right outside of the waiting room and they're sliding glass, four foot wide glass doors, but they have hypergraphics on them, one, two, and three to designate the rooms. And they also have a 3M uh, perforated coating that allows the nurses in the triage room to be able to see out into the waiting room, monitor it, but no one can see into the triage room. But you can't tell it. It's not like mirrored glass like you typically see or the blinds that you always have trouble with. Um, the other thing adjacent to the waiting room that's nice is there's a healing guarding that, uh, that the people actually, the patients actually have access to, family members, uh, people that are waiting that they can use while they're there waiting, they can go outside, but it's completely enclosed. It's not like they can wander off or people can come in from a different area. And let's see, in this particular side, one of the, one of the things that we were able to do that we really liked is we wanted to have um, a minor care area that we could street and treat, you know, take care of the fours and fives, keep them vertical. And so the initial design had four recliners just off of the triage. And then across from that, it had a sub waiting or a results waiting, waiting area. Um, as things happened through design, we ended up losing two of the recliners for a um, discharge consult area. And one of the things that I, that I think is very beneficial is the lessons learned to go through some of these things. And I uh, just want to point this out while I get the, the chance. That discharge called consulting area, just like in every one of the projects that we've done, uh, I think right now it's probably being used as storage. Uh, they would have been a lot better off having those other two recliners up there. And so in the future, it'll probably revert back to that. But if anybody tries to talk you into doing a dedicated discharge consulting area so that you can capture that patient as they're trying to make their way out, try and convince them that you can do recliners and actually uh, affect the patient flow much better. This is the waiting room when you walk in. Uh, you walk in through a main vestibule, 30 feet in front of that there is a nurse greeter or there's a greeter that, uh, that takes your information. Just directly adjacent to that is the security station that has complete oversight of both the waiting room and uh, of the greeting and of the vestibule and of the drop off. So if uh, you were able to look at it from behind this, you could see that you could have, you can see everything out into what's coming into the emergency department and know just like earlier, 
having a dock and triage, if there was one up here, would be able to walk and assess before they even came in the door. One of the unique features also is we decentralized as much as we could all the support space through this main spine. So we have two different sub waiting areas back into the emergency department itself. So this is for family that uh, they don't have to go back into the waiting area or it's used for patients as a results waiting area, but they are centralized or they are decentralized so that they service each one of the racetracks along that main spine. Uh, another unique component is we actually put a, a chapel that is for the emergency department only, and it sits uh, off of the, one of the first pods. An area of respite, family, it looks out into the healing garden, and uh, it gets utilized uh, more so than we originally had thought it would. And then, of course, you see the recliners um, in the minor carrier and what we call a hyper track or taking care of the fives and fours. And then this section through, you can see the ceilings in each one of the pod areas, like I said, are 17 feet, and the clear story glass allows the daylight in. And then from that mechanical spine um, on the back side of the pods, that's where we feed all of the air conditioning, everything else for it. And this is what each one of the pods look like. Once again, every one of them are identical, except for the color coding. So you see the bullpen or the care team area in there. And we wanted to keep it as collaborative of an environment as possible, but we still wanted to protect the doctors from interruption as much as possible while giving the nurses the opportunity to be on the front line. So the nurse station is without glass, without any type of visual protection, and the physician uh, component of it is on the backside there. It's acoustically separated by glass, but they can still visually have access to the rooms, to the patients. Although what we did do uh, after the fact is we frosted a band of glass so that when they're sitting and they're working, they have the choice as to whether or not they want to make eye contact with the patients or patient families or anything else just by simply looking up over the glass versus that opportunity where everybody approaches them because they don't have the option to hide behind it. Um, just directly behind that is the nourishment station that we also combined with their meds. So we don't have doors on it on either side. You can access it. And that has all of your nourishment, your fridge, your Pixis, your, your supply uh, cabinets, everything that is um, for that main pod. And you can see, I don't know if you guys can see it up there, but um, seven, nine, and six, those are basically the core support areas. And we focus those around the central area and then, and then those support the pods independently. One of the things that we did change in mid-design on this is the original design was to have the spine separating a 12-room pod and a 12-room pod. Um, halfway through the design, we actually shifted it. So we turned one pod, or the east side, or I'm sorry, the west side, into a nine-room configuration and the other one into a 15-room configuration. The initial thought was 10 rooms is good for a per-doc basis. Uh, so nine is no problem. The 15 was going to be too much for an individual doc, uh, but not enough for two. Uh, as they use it right now, they actually have two doctors in the 15-room pod and they float to the others, but the opportunity to introduce a mid-level into that will work out really well in the future, and they can have one doc and a mid-level servicing the 15-room pod. Once again, just another shot. This is the amber pod. The three pods, we had to color code them with the name. So amber, blue, and green were the three different pods that they came up with. And back to one of the comments that Sherry was talking about as far as the zones, they utilize the green pod, for instance, because it's close proximity to walk-in and the minor care as a, a fast track, if you will, to throw your threes in most of the time. And then, of course, the, the trauma pod is its own trauma pod, and then everything else falls in between. And so depending on the... Um, the volume and the time of the day, they can use these as mix and match since they're universal rooms for the most part, or they can designate a particular pod to take a particular acuity. And then this, another point, the room you're looking at right here, this is one of the things that we did change up as well. In order to make each one of the pods its own independent emergency department, if you will, we incorporated a single, what we call critical care room in the corner of each one. 
And that basically was a room that wasn't quite the size of a trauma room, what was almost double the size of a regular exam room. And we equipped it so that it could almost be a trauma room. Don't deal with traumas there, but you do take care of, you know, your recesses and innovations and some things that you need a little more space for. And each one of those individual pods has one of those rooms in there. Another one of the things that we dealt with is we were able to stack interstitial toilets in here so that you don't really notice where the toilets are, but if you did a flat ratio, you have a one to four ratio, one exam room, or one toilet for every exam room, which you don't see a lot of. I know that you guys probably, in most of your emergency departments, uh, would like to have a lot more toilets. These guys actually have four, if depending on the pod configuration, up to four rooms that have private toilets uh, to the room, and then they have another two rooms that are shared by the remaining rooms in that pod. Uh, the trauma pod that you see here, uh, what we ended up doing is we have five actual trauma rooms. We have three adjacent to the main ambulance bay, and then across from the spine we have another two. The main trauma pod, which has the three, in order to keep the trauma rooms as free and uncluttered as possible and to maximize the space and efficiency, we actually left uh, a cased opening on the back of each one of the trauma rooms and all three of them are serviced by a central supply room. So this is where your bear huggers and all your cabinets are and your crash carts and everything else. And you don't have to dedicate that piece of equipment for each one of these rooms. Instead, they just share that pool in the back and it really frees up the space in there. And you can see right there, there's one of the trauma rooms or just a clip of it. And then just on the back wall, you simply walk back there for everything that you need. So your airway cabinets, everything else is back there and you're able to access that without having to go, to go through doors or anything else. Uh, once again, a section cut of the height and, and kind of how the, each one of the pods are laid out. Now, I have to say, I've been doing this for 15 years, and this is the first time that we have ever been able to incorporate a imaging unit of, of this size. This is a dedicated, embedded imaging suite for the emergency department. Of course, they, they can justify it because they run all of their night stuff through here too, so they, they're using it all the time. It's not just for the ED, but it's primarily for the ED, and it's in the emergency department, so they get uh, direct access to it. It's made up of two CTs, one of which they just recently replaced. Initially, it was an installation, the eighth installation of Toshiba's uh, 320 slice. Um, they had some issues with it, so now it's gone, but uh, they still have two CTs in there, two regular rads, two ultrasound rooms, uh, one magnet, and a shell space for another magnet. Uh, you don't see this too often. And once again, it is all of 40 feet from uh, the trauma bay and directly off of the main spine so that it's as accessible as you could possibly have it. One of the other uh, interesting features of this is the radiologists, you know, trying to get them to read in a timely manner and make sure that they were doing everything that they needed to do. We promised them everything they could possibly have and gave them two dedicated rooms, as much room for their couch and everything else that they needed. Uh, right adjacent to the trauma pods, right in the, emergent, in the uh, imaging suite. And the only thing we asked is that uh, we could have uh, glass doors so we could know when they were not, not answering the door. So, but they're, they're happy, they actually stay in there, they read, um, everybody's happy with it. The other, uh, the other built out component of this is uh, a, a staff break room and staff lockers, a separate physician uh, lounge across from the main staff locker. But it, um, it leads to an outside, you'll see in some other things, but it leads to an outside uh, patio and uh, it's really nice amenity for the staff that, that they like. And then there's, you know, just nice, clean, big imaging rooms. Another, another uh, substantial feature of this is a 26-bed all-private room CDU that, once again, is as close to the emergency department as you can get. We uh, wrestled initially with this. We, they, have, they have some substantial bedding uh, issues upstream, and so their capacity issues, this is kind of a governor for it, plus it was a great opportunity to introduce something like this. Uh, in hindsight, if we could, we'd probably reduce the number down to something more manageable of about 20. Uh, manageable in the sense that we packed as many as we could in the space that we had, 
and as many toilets to take care of that, and the ratio really needs to be increased. I think it's a one to four ratio in here, but that's the number one complaint that we get is there's not enough toilets for the number of bed, private beds. So in hindsight, we, put a, we probably would have added more toilets and sacrificed rooms. Uh, another unique component is what we call our uh, education space or command center. Dead in the center, there's a room right there that, uh, that is mainly an education space for most of the time, but it's tied in in the AV system to fire, rescue, police, everything, mass disaster, command center type deal. And they actually got to use it. Um, I think they were not even up a year whenever the tornado in Joplin, Missouri took out the hospital and, and did all the damage there. They received a, a, quite a bit of, of the uh, wounded from that event. So they got to see it in action and, and watch it pay dividends. This is an interior shot of the OBS unit, similar to what we did on the, on the main ED, just a smaller version. Each one of the rooms, private, sliding glass doors, um, you know, has, has all the amenities for, for the family, as much space as possible. And um, everybody, you know, views and, and circulation and everything are set up quite nicely. They, oh, I'm sorry. They have a, uh, a lot of helicopter traffic, more helicopter traffic than I've seen at any other organization. Uh, we put two helipads on top of the emergency department and fed them to an elevator that drops directly down into the emergency or into the uh, trauma pod. And they have another two existing helipads that are about 400 yards away that they use for service pads. Um, the, the same way with the air traffic, they have, a, they have a lot of ambulance providers out there aside from their competition and their own ambulance service. And so they see a lot of ambulance traffic. We provided them with a completely enclosed, conditioned uh, six ambulance bay, high-speed garage door uh, bay. And then John Archer, uh, the director, um, went one step further, and we created probably the only mass disaster, mass casualty containment garage uh, situation that I'm aware of. We have the regular decon situation where we have multiple shower heads and the rollers. You can push the people through and process them. And then if needed, uh, just like in a gymnasium, you can divide with a tarp. You can pull down and, and divide the garage in half and we have hoses that string down and come down and you can, you know, do mass casualty uh, decontams all the way through there if it was ever necessary. Once again, the staff amenity spaces, the break lounge in the back, the, the lockers, the, the outdoor courtyard for them. And the room that you see on the, on the bottom right hand is their command center, their education center where they do most of their training and everything. This was before they did the full install with the AV. It looks like, I mean, it looks like something out of Hollywood. It's got multiple screens and it's all tied into everything across the, across the state and they, uh, they use it quite a bit for, for a multitude of things. And then from a design standpoint, uh, you know, back to the emergency department is the front door in every way these days. Well, physically, where we put this emergency department was on the south side of the hospital, which is where most of the people come from a traffic standpoint to get to the hospital. So visibility was key. Off of the main highway, uh, you can see the emergency department. So we took the opportunity. We incorporated a, a garden that was accessible both from the emergency department and from the waiting room and gave, gave patients and families a, a place where they could go outside if they wanted to. But as, uh, as part of that, we needed to screen it off and fence it in and also protect it from the sun. So what we did was we built a 14 foot high, 120 feet long stainless steel fence. And then we CNC'd in uh, 12 foot letters that say emergency. And so literally the signage for the hospital, for the emergency department is on the facade of the building, uh, which, is, which is pretty unique. At night, you see it from you can see it from half a mile away, uh, along with the clear story and the lighting, but that designates exactly what it is and where to go. So there's no confusion at all when you approach the campus as to where the emergency department is. Um, and in the essence of time, um, I'm all done there. I can take questions, anything that you have. Yes, sir.
Everything, well, everything is patient-centric from that standpoint. So we do, have the, we do have the main radiology department there, but they also have, I believe, two portables. Three? Five. Yeah, five portables. In, because one of the things, sorry about this, I, I, I have to apologize. There are so many things about this that I take for granted and I forget. So in each one of the pods, you have the corners that are, that are uh, support space. And each one of those support spaces uh, house a, um, a portable x-ray machine. And so that mini emergency department pod has access to both ultrasound and x-ray where you can go in and out of that pod instead of having to take them all the way back to radiology. John, yeah, well, I tell you what, here you go. Well, he'll use that microphone and he'll give you, he'll give you the direct. The question was uh, how many ankles and things are being done in the room versus going back to the main emergency or main imaging department. Portables versus going to a room. One thing Sean left out, and I know he covered a lot in a short time, but in the uh, the amber pod on the west side, so basically dead center of all five of these, he put a radiology. Uh, suite or excuse me a radiology room for plain films with fluoro and we use that for all that little stuff that comes in and we did that because then if we're getting backlogged like we all do um, we can get those x-rays rolling even while they're in a wait wait time waiting to get back to a room and have results before they when they get seen make a dispo and then in the main radiology suite as you said there are two more rad rooms and we I'd say we do and that's just due to our radiology pref radiologist preferences they take probably 90% to the, to the radiology rooms and the rest will do portable. You know, chess will do portable all day long, but most of the radiologists don't like the quality of the film from a digital. But what we like about digital is, in the, especially in the trauma bays, um, we put packs in all those rooms and they'll shoot the digital and in 60 seconds we have it on packs, just they fire it right there. And that took us from the dark ages. One thing that, and I don't know, how many of you guys in your trauma bays have overhead x-ray? We had that, but the bang for the buck is really not there. You know what I mean? It just sat there all the time, and we'd get good quality images, but it's it's a waste of money, especially with digital portable machines and the quality that they produce now. So, yeah. um, yes, Senator. How much would the total cost be from breaking the ground, opening the door? How long did it take to build? Uh, total cost on the project. Um, well, let's put it in perspective. <laughs> now you got the contractor <laughs> talking. This is uh, total project is 87,000 square feet, and what you don't see is that included also a tunnel component that tied into service, laundry, everything, because we separated that traffic as well. You're not going to see anything from dietary, any of that stuff coming up. It has its own dedicated elevator, and and so it doesn't cross. And then we also did the same thing. We for patient traffic, for transports, for back to the bed tower. We literally have an elevator that goes up and a rooftop connector dedicated just for patient traffic so they don't have to cross through public areas. So when you take all of that into consideration, the total construction cost was $32 million. Um, and that's, that's, that's fees, GCs, everything, that's, that's loaded. Um, total project cost, imaging equipment, FF&E and everything uh, was right at uh, $46 million. The budget initially set was $50 million. Um, and so we were able to come in under, but um, the, if you want to look at a, a comparative square foot cost, because I know people try to use that as a measure, uh, it was $335 a square foot, but that's with all of those bells and whistles, with all of those additional components, the roofs, uh, connectors, all of those things. And how long did it take to build? Um, we were done in 13 months. And, and this, this project, I guess it's not fair uh, because we, we designed and we built it, so we're, it's a little quicker uh, in that delivery system. So uh, this probably in a traditional format would have taken 15, 16 months. I had a question over here, Sean. Um, I'm sorry. What, no, it's okay. What, what we had before, well, we were jamming 60, I, th I think 66,000 through a 24 bed ED. And as you guys know, that's busy. That included 17 pissed off hall beds every day. Um, yeah. <laughs> I was actually a patient in the old ED in a five hour hall bed and I was the guy designing the place. So um, 
That, that is true. Yeah. That is true. Um, but no, that was 17,000 square feet, their original ED, yeah. with those, if you want to call them rooms, spaces. And well, and actually now we're 44,000, is that right, for the actual ED proper? Yeah, for the ED proper, we were able to pack in 62 rooms in 44,000 square feet. Now that's exclusive of the CDU and of, you know, radiology and, and, and the other stuff. But yes, sir, in the back. Um, it's, uh, it's beautiful, and I commend you for your, for your work. Um, there's two key things, though, that I see missing. One is the gym, and the other is the steam room. <laughs> okay, so I got, I got threatened with my job if I put a basketball court on the outside patio. So They took the hoop off the basketball, honestly, honestly. But, but seriously, um, do, do, you, do you have a volume or have a need for mental health, emergency mental health, sequestering rooms, uh, protecting rooms? These all look pretty generic. Uh, what, what we did, and he didn't, yeah, sorry, in essence of time, too. he didn't go into detail, but there are two totally psych safe rooms completely and we only use them when it's the real real nice ones that are you know come in on poly substance and that has to include pcp and meth they go in there but the rest of the behavioral psych if they're calm cool and collected we put them in any room yeah because because of the visual access you can just like you said you can put those in the rooms and then the really the real bad ones we we did the full-on vestibule sitter you know toilet uh, seclusion room back there uh, but we don't see as much use, but the anticipation for the use is, is absolutely there. So we were just having this discussion yesterday because we're doing one right now, and that's a big contention point. And, you know, five years from now, absolutely. We're a little unique of a system because our, we have a sister hospital that we own as well that has our inpatient psych unit. And so they, the region EMS guys know to take them to that ED, yes. right? So that's a whole different nightmare in itself. <laughs> Sir. Isolation or ah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Another unique feature. So every one of these pods, remember the concept is independent emergency department mini pod. So at the end um, of every pod, so in this diagram, label number six, there are two rooms and they're the same in every single pod. Those are their isolation rooms with dedicated toilets flanking on either side. Um, so you, you always know in every pod where your isolation rooms are. And in addition to that, one of the things that uh, John asked to have is the opportunity for a SARS event or something like that to be able to flip that OBS unit with a button and now you got an entire isolation unit, 26 rooms. And so that is in place. And we, we did that actually was on for about three months here recently. Um, you know, we are, the end rooms, as Sean was saying, are negative airflow, and, but all of the sidewall are positive airflow. Each of them has an air exchange. On the end is four minutes, on the sidewall, seven. So when we had all this flu stuff going on, the inpatient was a grinding halt because they were saying that they had to, uh, uh, the EVS guys had to sit on the room or block the room for a length of time, like an hour, hour and a half, for the airflow to turn over before they could even go in and clean the room. And we're like, uh, not here. As soon as you get your card here, air's clean. Get in there. So, yeah, one exchange, and it's sixty-eight percent clean already. Thanks. Yes. So how have your operational numbers been impacted by having more stays? Is your throughput um, longer now? Well, that's a great question. You know, uh, the, you guys heard if they build it, they will come. Well, if you don't build it, they will come, and if you build it, they will come faster. And, and due to the process changes, it doesn't matter how much planning and preparing we did, and my, my team back here, um, about a third of the nurses said, to hell with it, I'm out of here. And so we then spent a year and a half getting back up to staff. And we've just accomplished that last August. Yeah, I'd say August, where we're just fully staffed, almost no overtime. and. Since that time, we've also made a couple additions since then. We've really finally perfected what I would say matching our staffing and physician, nursing staffing and physician staffing patterns with our arrival times. And so our door to doc time is now, we cut it from the first year was 97 minutes and we're down to under 35, so consistently. With that, we've seen our LBS cut. Uh, Jim commented on an email last week that our, our LBS went from 5.5% to we're running right at 1.5 consistently now. And our customer service scores, as you guys all know, go right up with that because they go hand in hand. Nobody pays to wait. Yeah, and 
Uh, just one last thing on the patient flow. And I see I cut you off, Jim. On the patient flow that Sherry talked about earlier, um, it was funny back there. He, he and his guys were asking about the patient flow with that. We called it, they, they came up with this when we were doing this, but we have a comms nurse centralized right there behind uh, in the green pod, and she is responsible for placing every single patient, no matter how they come in, ambulance, transfer, whatever it is, and that really also adds to the, to the efficiencies of, of the facility, is being able to know where and how and when at all times. I'm just gonna add from doing lots and lots of construction projects, it's a rare leader that can lead through a redesign project and survive into the new ED. So you gotta write down a lot of the stuff that you were doing and thinking of. Second is if you leap over one of those 20,000 volume increments, you really change your process altogether. And you do lose a lot of staff. And it's best to implement your IT changes before you move into the new emergency department. Oh yeah, we did that. <laughs> one success. <factor. laughs> we did that about eight months prior to going in. We, we went from paper to electronic. Yeah. So I, mean, I had double whammy for staff satisfaction. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and across the board as much as you can. I mean, they tried to ramp up for staffing. They got the IT working on board. I mean, the mock-ups, the physical mock-ups were built a year before the thing was, was being built so that there was no question about what needed to be in each one of the individual spaces. Those are all extremely key that, uh, unfortunately, a lot of people, until they you know, have lived it, they don't realize how early you have to start with that process. Yes. Uh, great question. Once again, I forget um, the repeat, entire. Repeat the question. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, the question was soundproofing, noise level. So just like with many of the things that we heard today, uh, we have white noise or actually pink noise throughout the entire thing. It knocks down probably 30% of, of everything you would have, masks it. In addition to that, like was referenced earlier, they're called NTC uh, panels. And so instead of the typical acoustical ceiling tiles, they have a, a foil backing to them of fiberglass, and they reduce uh, sound uh, sound absor or they increase sound absorption as well. So, and and the masking systems, I mean, that's a no-brainer. You guys should do that no matter what facility you're in, new or old or how. It's really cost-effective way get in there. Uh, you can implement that tomorrow. And doors on every room instead of curtains. That's true. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> and and the sliding glass doors, um, I, I think that that's. We haven't done an emergency department in the last seven years that didn't have sliding glass doors. We just take it for granted because I see, I see other, you know, projects that just have four-o doors, and and you don't realize what a difference it makes. Operationally, um, I can, all this tells it all. You guys all deal with the the almighty grievances, right? We waste a bunch of our time on this stuff. Our complaints were always, well, I overheard people, whatever. And in this ED, our complaints are, well, I waited in the waiting room for an hour and you guys aren't even busy when every room is full. The place looks dead and it's quiet. It's really low key. It's, a, it's pretty amazing. Any of you guys are welcome to come see it. Not, God knows I give enough tours. Thanks to him. There's too much. <laughs> Any music, television, or anything in there? Every room has TV. That's a great question, but no, we don't. Um, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Do we measure our, our throughput metrics by pod? No, we do it overall by hour of the day. And so we shift our resources based on when we're see, seeing changes in our arrival patterns. So we're just now, literally, the, our medical director and I were discussing, as I'm kicking them in the butt, we've got to have a doc extend their shift from an eight to a nine hour shift. I need somebody coming in an hour earlier every day, just based on that jump in arrivals. But we're going to wait a couple months. A couple of changes we did, we recently made is we, let me back up. When we opened this thing, we thought that based on volume and room space turns per day, we thought, you know what, we're going to live in three pods for about two or three years. We opened the fourth pod within six months. We opened the fifth pod this last October 26th. February 1st, we added a mid-level. So our volumes are going up. but. As we're doing it, we just want to do it right. We want people, they don't come in, let's face it, they don't come in to see the registrar or the triage nurse. They come to see you guys. So they come in, we got a chief complaint, quick reg. We have a transporter, not a nurse, not an ER tech even, a $9 an hour transporter, scoop in a wheelchair and take them to a room. And they just, we keep the cycle going. So our metrics, we don't do by pod, that's something we could look at. However, our staff rotate. Um, considerably. We use that fifth pod, the one we just opened, it's just eight hours a day right now, 
peak eight. Um, and we try to keep the acuities around three in that room, not the super sick stuff, so that they can turn a little better. And, and then the, the mid-level, the single mid-level, we have a real low uh, volume of low acuity patients, and we admit 33% of our patients that arrive. Now, one thing that kind of skews the whole numbers is we have an urgent care on campus on the opposite end that sees 42,000. So yeah. their fours and fives are minimal compared to most facilities. But that, there's enough to keep one mid-level provider busy still. Yes. Um, we could shut down early, but it's obviously hard to open early because you're getting the staff to come in because they know they're, they're on set arrival patterns throughout the course of the day. So, um, at, you know, two of them around the clock, uh, two more 16 hours a day, and then the one is eight. And I'm wanting to make that 16 to 17 and extend it earlier. But we're pretty fluid in it and, and address it. And our staff, thank God, we are very receptive to Crystal back there that when she says, okay, I need you to change your shift. You were 11, now I need you to be a one-to-one. -one. And you always get volunteers that want to do it, so. I would suspect this is a challenge, and this would actually be a challenge to anybody that's in on anything other than a 20,000 uh, visit, tiny little ER. Um, the care and feeding of the pods, I would call it. So you'll always hear complaints right if you're in your well those guys in the blue zone they the blue bullpen they don't they're not pulling their share so do you have a strategy for where does the next patient go uh, that's a great question and even though we do it very well consistently um sean back up to the one with the arrows you know pointing the directional flow gotcha um well but what we do is we tell them to shut up <laughs> put on your big boy pants uh, quit worrying about each other because docs and nurses are equally guilty all day, every day of that complaint. Oh, yeah. But that comms nurse, as, as Sean alluded to a little bit ago, they, they control all flow inbound, no matter where they come from. Yep. Transfers, EMS, walk-ins, they assign patients, and they do it rotationally. So you're getting the next one, you're getting the next one. Well, if you notice the ambulance entrance there, we try, we're not 100% successful due to this rotational pattern, but we try to keep the ambulance patients in those two blue pods. It's geographically closer. We try to keep the walk-ins in the amber or the green pods. It's geographically closer. It makes more sense. So, but we, we rigidly stick to the rotational pattern. Okay. Uh, two things that I want you to know. And that put, I'm sorry to yeah. cut you off, but I want to point one, that put pressure on those docs that weren't holding their own. Yeah. Okay, you're going to keep up with the pace of your partners from this model. So, so I know someone at RAND who's working on a model that can calculate the workload and it's a combination not just of ESI when they get there but orders that need to be done, imaging that needs to be done, results that are back that need to be processed for this. A very complicated model that will predict who has the lightest workload when you've got multiple zones or pods mm -hmm. so who should get the next hit. So that's one novel idea and another one that I saw that was homegrown at a hospital where the docs could enter into the tracking system if they couldn't, because, because it's Las Vegas, I'm gonna put it this way, they couldn't take another hit. You know, blackjack hit me, don't hit me. So they were allowed under certain circumstances to say, I can't take anybody for a while. Like they're doing resuscitation or, you know, they've got a stroke or something. And then they're supposed to push it back when, Judy, I'm gonna take us off divert. It was like a, a pod diversion, if you will, when you're on overdrive. And so I liked both of those ideas that we could somehow be a little bit more objective and a little more real time at who gets the next patient. Cause I'm sure you get grumbling about that. I'm well, sure you get grumbling. They all trust me have the, uh, the comms phone on speed dial. So they can call nurses or physicians say, Hey, you know what? Skip me this round. Yeah. Um, yeah. They don't very often because some of them want to do that when they don't need skipped and they don't know what's going on in the other pod. They think they do, but they don't. There's only seven patients over there. I've got 10. Yeah, but three of those are getting on vents right now. Right. You know what I mean? Right, exactly. So we try to police that. Another thing that, that we actually use to, to help offset variations in the acuity of each pod is that amber uh, east one. The, the, it's one of the ones that stays over 24 seven. Um, it's the 15 bed one there in the middle. There's a, a second dock in that one that takes six rooms there and three in the green, typically. Well, that person also floats to any other pod that needs help. If there's just a patient that they are just too overwhelmed with, they can go over there and help them out. Well, 
sorry, I'll just repeat it. The concept of load leveling, you should be thinking about as you expand into different geographic zones or pods. That's also why um, initially, Sean is correct initially, that green pod was going to be kind of the fast track stuff. Well, we decided real quick, that's, that is not an equal load. So we use every pod, we try to spread the wealth. So you can everything from death and dying to you know, sprained ankles in any pod. Yeah, which you have the capacity to handle. I was gonna ask the staff for ops, is it mid-level? Hospitalists. Yes. <laughs> yeah, the original concept was that the, e the ED would take care of it, but then once everybody started looking at how do we get compensated, physician-wise, who, who controls it, how do I take care of that guy that's that far away, that's not fair, it all defaulted back to the hospitalist. And they love it, to be quite honest. They leave hospitalists there 24 seven. Oh yeah, hospitalists are good. It's just the whole hospital uses that thing too. Last question. 600 yards. Yeah. About 10 a day. Repeat the question. Oh, I'm sorry. Patients showing up in the urgent care that need emergency care, about 10 times a day, we, uh, they, they either bring them down or we have a few that we've amb ambulanced over, so. Yep. Thank you yep. both. Peace. Sean. Thank you very much.